Well, welcome everybody to Blackwater Draw National Historic Landmark Archaeological Site. My name is Brendan Asher, and I'm the director here at Blackwater Draw. And today, for this particular scene, we're actually in what's referred to as the South Bank Interpretive Center, which is a, a portion of the site that's actually protected by an enclosed shelter. And what you'll see today in this particular portion of the tour is some of the ongoing excavations that have actually been exposed since the late 1970s, but really since about 1983, 1984 is when we started working in this area. And it's a significant locality, Blackwater Draw itself, and I should at least tell you where we're located for those of you that have not been able to visit. We are on the Southern High Plains. We're on the western edge of the Llano Estacado, and we're right off of New Mexico Highway 467 between the cities of Clovis to the north and Portales to the south. And today, when you visit this area, you'll notice that it's very dry, it's very flat, there's not very many trees, uh, we don't get very much precipitation in a typical year, but prehistorically that was not the case. And actually, what we'll see today in this interpretive center is evidence of climate change through time uh, dating back to over 13,000 years ago when this site was actually uh, a prehistoric lake, a spring-fed lake of fresh water that was probably about 80 acres in extent but maybe not very deep, maybe one to three feet deep as far as we can tell and the quality of that water would change from season to season and year to year uh, depending on precipitation and local climate and environment and so forth. But the reason that animals were coming here prehistorically was because it was a local watering hole. And that attracted humans. So 13,000 years ago, we had humans on this landscape that were out here hunting large animals, some of which are no longer around today, including the mammoth. Uh, Camel, which maybe they were hunting here, we don't know. We were working on a recent camel excavation, uh, but certainly bison and mammoth uh, 13,000 years ago. So this is at the very bottom layers, the oldest layers that we have exposed. It is dated to the end of the last ice age, the, the terminal Pleistocene, if you want to think about geologic time periods. But today what we're going to see actually in this building are two separate events. Uh, separated by several feet of sediment that are slightly younger but still very old. And we'll just start down here at the bottom and it, it's kind of hard to see because we do have a railing and, and we'll try to do the best that we can. But there is a layer of bones down here that's low uh, where my feet are on this level. And what I'm standing on right now, this surface, it is right around 12,000 years old. And when you look across this same level, you'll notice that there's actually uh, bison skeletons. These are all uh, bison, similar to modern bison today, but a prehistoric uh, form or species of modern bison that was about 25 to 30% larger than anything that we see today. And these animals were hunted in this exact location uh, prehistorically by humans. And you'll notice if you go up a little bit higher, there's a more extensive, uh, what we refer to just as a bone bed in archaeology. And this is slightly younger in age. Uh, it's still old. It's still nine to 10,000 years old. But uh, it's again evidence of repeated use of this exact same location thousands of years ago by prehistoric hunters. So we have a couple questions we need to ask. And the first is, why are these bones here in the first place? And I already sort of answered that. Part of it's related to climate and environment and changes through prehistory. And it's related to the prehistoric lake that primarily was back behind us. So uh, if you get a chance to visit the archeological site, we have a walking trail that's about a mile long if you do the entire trail. And the trail itself is the boundaries of that prehistoric lake. And the trail itself, if you visited, you know, it's right just north of this building. 
So we're on the south edge of that prehistoric lake. So I always use this kind of as an analogy. Think about if you have a spring-fed lake, think about a modern bathtub. If you leave the water running too long, it overflows eventually. That water has to go somewhere. And where did the water go? Well, we are standing in what was prehistorically the low spot topographically on the landscape. So we are in uh, the outlet channel or the outflow channel uh, of that prehistoric pond, which flowed directly south through the back of our interpretive center here. And humans prehistorically used that feature on the landscape to their advantage to hunt these bison. And what they would do is they would intercept them somewhere on the high plains, southern high plains, and then they would herd them into that outlet channel until they hit a point where they could go no further. So we have a lake back behind us. They get to that spot and they can't go any further. They're essentially trapped. So prehistoric hunters 12,000 years ago would have been standing on each side of this outlet channel and throwing their spears or uh, using a tool known as an atlatl to propel a dart to dispatch these animals. So what we see is two separate kill events. Uh, the bottom layer has nine animals in it so far. Uh, that number will continue to increase as we excavate more in this shelter. And the top layer, the upper layer that's a little bit younger, has 22 animals so far. So we see direct evidence of prehistoric hunters uh, from the end of the last ice age hunting bison in this location in this outlet channel to this prehistoric lake. So this is for us a way to visualize prehistoric activities that took place in this locality and we can begin to picture that a little bit better when we look at the changes in the colors in the soils themselves which we refer to as stratigraphy in archaeology. And this is where we can actually tell climate change by looking simply at the color changes in the soils. And at our lowest level, which you won't be able to see because it's down below my feet, uh, we actually see pebbles that are rounded. It looks like they've been in a rock tumbler. And these are evidence to us as archaeologists and geologists as well that this sediment has been transported by an active spring, a stream deposit. So we see evidence for active streams, and that's 13,000 years ago, which today when you visit the Llano Estacado, you don't see very many active streams. We move up a little bit later in time, and you'll begin to see these darker sediments. And anytime you see dark soil like this, it tells us as archeologists that there's a lot of organic material in that. And organics, what you need to think about, uh, vegetation essentially. So uh, grass and, and vegetation land cover, which requires water. So we know that there was still a fair amount of precipitation, a fair amount of water during this time. Um, not surprisingly, this is when we see our first bison kill at this locality. Um, at least in this interpretive center, we have older kills outside of the building, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But we know that 12,000 years ago, humans were at this locality hunting these skeletons that you see in front of you. And then later in time, you'll notice, uh, and later in time, we move higher up in the profile, in the stratigraphic profile, you'll notice that the colors of the soils are changing. And what becomes very obvious is that once you get up above this bone layer, the color changes to kind of a, a light orangish brown color, whereas below that, it's more of a gray, a darker organic rich sediment. And this tells us as archeologists that the environment changed to very dry compared to what it was prior in time. And not surprisingly, when you look throughout that profile, that four or five feet of sediment, you don't see very much bone in it. 
And the reason is the prehistoric lake I was telling you about that was back behind us here, it had dried up by that time. So animals were no longer uh, periodically, or at least I should say probably seasonally, visiting this location. They were probably going somewhere else where there's more predictable water sources. And not surprisingly, humans who were hunting these animals uh, were no longer visiting this locality in the intensity that they were, uh, that we see in these two kill events prehistorically. So we have the kill, uh, the bottom layer, there's only been one or two projectile points, so chip stone spear points that have been found uh, associated with those skeletons. So we know that they were actually killed by humans. Uh, this top layer, there's been seven spear points that have been found, uh, many of them actually outside of the structure. So this particular event, it extends beyond the structure that was constructed in the, the late 1990s that protects this particular portion of the bone bed itself. So we have evidence of the kill itself, but also we need to think prehistorically, why are they hunting these animals? Well, obviously it's for food, but it's also to acquire the hide, which you're going to create your clothing and your shelters out of. It's also to acquire the sinew or the tendons, uh, which you'll use for sewing as well as lashing those prehistoric spear points onto the, the dart shaft they're using to actually kill these animals, but also to get the bones themselves. So bone, when it's fresh, you can break it and it flakes the same way that stone will. So you can actually make bone tools uh, out of the fresh green bones of these animals. So we have the kill, the butchery and processing. And what's really fun about this particular locality is you can actually see evidence of the butchery and the processing in this site. And what I'll show you carefully as I kind of scamper up the, the bank here is evidence of that. So when you pan from the east to the west, and if you just follow the change in color and soil, what you will notice once you get to the west side is that this gray color is sloping up. Okay, so it's getting higher in elevation. And this is the prehistoric surface. It's about 10,000 years old. And what we can see over here is a pile of bones, okay? And these bones are not natural in the sense that we don't see a complete skeleton of a bison here, what we actually see is multiple bison represented, but only by particular pieces of those skeletons. And specifically what we see are the scapula. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We have 10 scapula, which are the shoulder blades of the bison in this pile. As well in this pile, we also see one of the very few pieces of a skull cap, the, the upper crania of a bison, and it's actually upside down. Uh, it's sitting on top of this plastic bag just to support it. But that is an anomaly in the rest of this bone bed in the sense that we do not see the crania. We see a lot of the lower jaws, which are the mandibles, which you maybe saw out in the bone bed itself, but we don't see the top of the skulls. And that's a pattern prehistorically that's very interesting and intriguing. And it suggests to us, remember we have 22 animals in this layer. There should be theoretically 22 skulls. There's not, there's one, at least the, the upper portion, the crania. So that tells us that prehistorically they're actually removing the heads of these animals. And they're probably building a pile of skulls somewhere nearby that we just simply have not discovered yet here at Blackwater Draw. Now the scapula or the shoulder blades, that tells us directly uh, about the butchering practices of over 10,000 years ago. So they're coming in and they're quartering these animals. They're cutting off the, the upper limbs, so the arms, so to speak. Uh, they would also cut off the lower limbs and probably took them somewhere else. 
but they're dragging them up a little bit higher, okay? So keep in mind, we're higher in elevation here. So they're dragging these forelimbs up to finish processing, to finish cutting off the meat, and they would take the meat back to their camp, which we have evidence of camps nearby, which we'll point out as we walk along the trail here. And that's their food, that's their dinner, and they would preserve that in various forms, various ways. Uh, oftentimes not very dissimilar to the way you make jerky today, uh, so that it could be preserved for months at a time. And you could continue to eat uh, from this particular event, which only represents probably a single day or maybe a few days in the lifetime of these prehistoric hunters that visited this site. But we know from evidence of two different bone beds here that these prehistoric hunters revisited this locality through time, and that's why it's one of the most significant sites in all of North America. We have evidence from 13,000 years ago all the way up to historic times. And people were constantly uh, throughout time coming back to this locality to perform various tasks. But what we see primarily in the shelter itself is the hunting of prehistoric species of bison. So that's really cool and fun. And this is one of the few uh, localities in all of North America where you can actually come into an enclosed shelter and see uh, the entire cultural sequence of human occupation in the North Americas as we know it currently today. But that's not actually the reason why this site is so important and why it's so significant. And the reason this site is as important as it is, is related to the timing of the discovery of it. Uh, it was discovered very early on in the early 1900s. And at the time, the, the general thinking or understanding of when humans may have been uh, in North America. Okay, so this is a, a complex question and there's a lot of moving parts to it, but essentially the basics are that this site was discovered in 1929 by a young rancher at the time, he was 19 years old, by the name of James Ridgely Whiteman. And he was out here uh, during what was becoming the, the Dust Bowl era of the late 1920s, early 1930s. So we have a lot of erosion taking place, a lot of deflation, uh, primarily from droughts and heavy winds. Uh, it's always windy here on the Southern High Plains. And that was exposing ancient bones. And he noticed within these bone scatters that he was finding, there were human-made artifacts, chipped stone artifacts, spear points, uh, mixed with what at the time he referred to as elephant bones. And he essentially was correct. Uh, we know today that they weren't elephants in the modern sense, but they were Columbian mammoth remains. And this is some of the first evidence in North America of human artifacts, human-made artifacts, being found with Columbian mammoth remains in 1929. And he sends letters to the Smithsonian Institution trying to get professional archeologists to come out and visit this site and unfortunately, it falls somewhat on deaf ears. Uh, nobody really comes out to visit it seriously uh, until 1932. And in 1932, an archeologist by the name of Edgar Howard came out and visited this site in August uh, from the University of Pennsylvania. He was actually a master's student in archeology. span He went back to school later in life and he decided he wanted to study early humans in North America. And at the time he thought we were gonna find them in caves. There's no caves, mostly, very few, if any, on the Llano Estacado, on the Southern High Plains. So he started working in the Guadalupe Mountains in Southern New Mexico, down around Carlsbad. But he heard about this discovery of Ridgely Whiteman's in 1929, and eventually he would visit in 1932. And he decided this was probably a more significant site than what he was looking at down in the mountains. And he was gonna dedicate the next several field seasons of archeological research to this locality. So importantly, he goes back to Pennsylvania. So he visited in August, he goes back to Pennsylvania. Something else happens in 1932. 
and that is that the New Mexico Department of Transportation acquires the mineral rights, so to speak, so the, the rights to the sand and gravel uh, of this site in November. And they begin excavating to acquire sand and gravel to actually build the highway that today connects Clovis to Portales, New Mexico 467 Highway. And Howard, now back in Pennsylvania, he hears about this, and he comes back, which wasn't easy to do in 1932. Remember, there's no roads connecting this location really to anything, and that's the reason that they were getting the sand and gravel to build the highway. But in the gravel trenches that the Department of Transportation put in, he sees extensive deposits similar to what we see in this building of prehistoric animals mixed in with remains of artifacts made by humans. And he sends off a telegraph that essentially says, uh, we have an extensive archeological site 11 miles south of the town of Clovis. Uh, I'm gonna tie up permissions from the landowners and I'm gonna dedicate the next several years to researching this. And to our, our benefit as Clovis archeologists, quote unquote, that telegram gets intercepted by one of the major journals of the time, of the day. So this gets published internationally. So Clovis, as this site becomes known because of the nearby town of Clovis, it gets put on the books in November of 1932, which is a significant time period because that is the earliest documented publication of human remains, I should say human artifacts, found with mammoth remains in all of North America. And the particular style of artifact that uh, Edgar Howard was coming across, I have some in my pocket, they're not the real thing, don't worry, they're just replicas, are like this. And this is a cast or a modern replica of one of the projectile points or spear points. It was found here at Blackwater Draw with mammoth remains. And today this is what we refer to as Clovis technology, uh, which this site lends its name to after the nearby town, because this is what we refer to in archeology span as a quote unquote type site. And what that means is that this particular spear point, this particular uh, chipstone technology was first discovered here at Blackwater Draw, and it was first defined in the academic literature here at Blackwater Draw. And that's significant because this style of spear point is the most widespread geographically. We find it uh, from Canada all the way down to Central America and pretty much every state in between. Uh, and it's also one of the earliest chipstone technologies that we see in the entire New World in North America and it's named after this site right here, after Edgar Howard's work in 1932. So some of the locations I'll show you as we continue around uh, are the actual locations where most of the mammoth were discovered at this site. Uh, it's very fun to visit the interpretive center itself because this is the one location where we have ongoing excavations and you can see evidence firsthand of prehistoric hunting of animals and butchery of animals. But keep in mind, these layers are younger. Uh, they're more recent than the actual Clovis technology, which the site is famous for. So when you continue around the trail, we'll end up at an area kind of in the north corner of the site where a series of mammoth skeletons were discovered with several hundred uh, artifacts, many of which were spear points like this that date earlier, they're older than the bison that you see uh, in this interpretive center. All right, so we've moved from the interpretive center on the south bank into the area that's referred to as the, the north pit or the north bank. And those designations are related to the 1932 uh, New Mexico Department of Transportation gravel pits. They had two separate pits, uh, which then became commercial operations in the 1950s. So the locality that you see today is very different than what Ridgely Whiteman saw in 1929 when he first discovered this site. And what you'll see around the perimeters of the site is a large cliff face. 
And this is entirely artificial in the sense that it was not here prehistorically. Uh, this is created from sand and gravel mining, which in the 1950s, when it was a commercial operation, all the way up through the 1970s, they were removing one to 200 cubic yards of sand and gravel every single day. And to get to the sand and gravel, you had to actually excavate through the archeological deposits. So unfortunately for us, there was upwards of 200 cubic yards of archeology span that were being destroyed every single day from this locality. But at the same time, the benefit to us as archeologists was that they're actually uncovering uh, archaeological evidence that otherwise we probably wouldn't know was here. So remember I mentioned that this was a prehistoric lake thousands of years ago. We are now on the north end of that lake. We're actually in the area where the spring conduits were bubbling up out of the ground. So the fresh spring water was coming up out of the ground in this general location. And not surprisingly, this is also where we see the prehistoric camps. And one of the most significant prehistoric camps, which is a Folsom Age, which is a, a culture or technology that comes immediately after Clovis, which this site is famous for, is up on the bank, uh, directly to the west here, that's known as the Mitchell locality that was investigated uh, primarily in the 1980s. But it's an extensive Folsom Age camp. And it makes sense that they'd want to camp there because this is where the fresh spring water was coming out of the ground. Also importantly about this area, you'll notice that we've cleaned it off nicely. Uh, we have a, a shade pavilion in this particular portion of the site for when you get a chance to visit. In the 1960s, a series of mammoth skeletons were discovered in this general vicinity. Uh, four of them were partially complete and then there was one or two pieces from a fifth one. But what's important about that is that all of these skeletons were associated with human-made artifacts that date back to the Clovis period. And some of them were directly associated with these skeletons, which gives us direct evidence that humans were actually hunting mammoth 13,000 years ago in this exact same spot. Now, this locality or this area today, what we use it for is our annual atlatl competition. So an atlatl is a essentially just a stick, but it's a little bit more than that. Uh, you have a hook on one end, you have a handle on this end, and sometimes uh, prehistorically these would come with a weight that's attached, kind of a counterbalance weight. This is just an ex a simple example, a modern example of one. And the hook would actually fit into the end of the dart, all right? And typically you'd have some sort of fletching on the end. Sometimes you don't need the fletching at all, uh, made out of maybe turkey feather or goose feather or something like that. And then on this end would be your spear point made out of your chipstone material. Uh, during Clovis time, so that big spear point I showed you earlier in the interpretive center, we don't have direct evidence that they were actually using atlatls at that time. They may have been, we just don't know yet. But we certainly think that by Folsom time, so this smaller spear point, and this is again a replica, pardon the flies, this is the Southern High Plains, the Llano Escada, a lot of flies. This is a replica of one of the Folsom age spear points, so a little bit younger in age than Clovis, that was found here at Blackwater Draw. And we suspect that by Folsom time, so 12,000 years ago, they were actually probably using the atlatl. Now, I didn't take the time to set up a target, and my target is a big rock that's really far away, and I know that realistically I cannot throw it that far, but I'm just gonna show you the, the general concept of how the atlatl works, and we won't hit the rock, luckily, uh, because it'd probably break the dart. But during our competition we have each year, which is the last week of October, the first thing that people struggle with is actually how you hold it. And it's a, a pretty simple device. The main thing to keep in mind is just keep the hook in the back end of the dart. All right, and people struggle with that. And then you just wanna hold it gently or lightly like a pencil, like you're writing with a, a number two pencil taking a Scantron exam. So you hold it lightly 
Uh, you don't want to hold it too hard or squeeze it too hard. The first mistake people make is they try to throw away too hard. And they'll come through and uh, usually what happens is the addle addle comes off the back of the dart. The dart ends up down here and half the time they might actually end up throwing the addle addle itself. Which prehistorically if you're trying to hunt a bison that's 30% larger than any modern bison today, that's not a good idea because it might make them angry and they might come chasing after you. And they can run 40, 45 miles an hour. So you want to make sure that you support the addle addle, you support the dart. And see, I just made the same mistake. <laughs> Flies are helping a lot. So we're going to just try to chuck it as far as we can. The other mistake most people make is they try to throw it too hard. All right. So... Uh, we don't want to try to throw too hard. It's simply a, a, a nice smooth motion uh, for anybody that fly fishes. This works as essentially just an extension of your arm. And that extension of your arm, which in this case is about 18 inches, uh, it provides you more leverage to propel the dart uh, much further in distance and with greater speed than if you're just trying to throw it uh, like a spear by hand. Theoretically with more accuracy, but I have not thrown one of these in at least a year So we're just gonna throw it in that general direction. We won't hit the rock But we'll see how it goes just so you can see how this works So at this point prehistorically I would have a bison that's angry probably charging at me and you'd want to hightail it out of here but also prehistorically, you wouldn't be standing this far away. You try to get within probably oh, 10, 15, 20 yards so that you could actually make a successful kill of that animal. And the target would be much bigger <laughs> than the rock I'm trying to throw at. So anyway, that's, uh, that's how uh, an addle addle works, the general properties of it. And we'd love to invite everybody out there to come visit the annual Addle Addle competition, which does take place, uh, unfortunately not this year, but in a typical year, the last weekend of October here at Blackwater Draw. And it's one of the few locations that I know of where you can actually throw prehistoric technology in the same locations that prehistoric people were using that same technology. So Blackwater Draw is primarily known for the archaeological deposits and the significance uh, for informing us about the early people in North America. But it's also unique because we have geologic aspects out here that people are interested in. And the oldest fossils we have from this site are five to seven million years old. And when you visit the locality, you can actually go in the visitor center up near the parking lot when you first stop in. And you can see the mandible, or the lower jaw, of what's referred to as a gompithere, which is similar to a mastodon or a mammoth, if you want to think about a mammoth. But instead of having two tusks, it actually had four. So it had two that came out and curled up like a typical mastodon or mammoth. But it also had two that went straight down, and they were kind of shaped like a spade, a, a digging spade. And for this reason, they're occasionally referred to as shovel tuskers. And we found the remains of one of those coming out of this deposit here, uh, which is right around five to seven million years old. What's unique about this deposit is that it did not originate here in eastern New Mexico. Now, what happened was millions of years ago, the Rocky Mountains, which are way to the west of us, were beginning to form. And as they're uplifting, as they're rising, we have a lot of erosion coming down slope to the east that extends all the way out to eastern New Mexico, western Texas, and it's depositing a bunch of sand and gravel and cobbles uh, that originated in the Rocky Mountains. So all of, or most parts of the Southern High Plains, they're underlain by this layer of sand and gravel, which is capped by kind of a white colored sediment that you can see that the locals refer to as caliche, at least in this part of the world. And the caliche is the cap rock to the Ogallala Aquifer, which is the large body of water, the underground reservoir that we're standing on top of. 
So prehistorically, this would have been inundated with water. Uh, the sand and gravel washed in from the Rocky Mountains, and this is five to seven million years old, at least in this part of the state. It gets older depending on where you are within uh, your geographic range. But as far as archeology, span this is too old. So if we want to look for evidence of Clovis people here, we have to look all the way at the top. And way up at the top, you might see a small little package of sediment that's kind of a, a grayish white color. And within that package of sediment, we know that there's late Pleistocene, so the end of the Ice Age, animal bones coming out. There's actually a camel skeleton that's eroding from that location uh, that we've been working with through Eastern New Mexico University using field schools, having students come out and actually work to excavate those camel remains, which are probably around 13,000 years old or slightly older, which would be the same time on the younger end that Clovis people were out here at Blackwater Draw. All right, so we're in the visitor center, the building we call visitor center anyway, here at Blackwater Draw. And this is the first location when you visit the site where you're actually going to check in. Uh, it's where we sell all of our handy merchandise if you want to take some swag home with you. But it's also one of the locations where you can look around on the walls and we have photographs, historic photographs and descriptions about the history of the locality and the important people, uh, significant people that made this discovery possible. And primarily one of these individuals is up here in the top left photograph. Uh, that is James Ridgely Whiteman later in life, and he's actually standing in front of a display of artifacts that he found out here at Blackwater Draw. So he is the person responsible for putting this site on the map uh, when he discovered the site in 1929. And just to the right of Ridgely, we have Edgar Howard. And Edgar is the master's student out of Pennsylvania that came out in 1932 and then worked from 1932 until 1936, 1937 out here. And in 1936 and 1937, he identified two spear points, two what we refer to today as Clovis spear points, uh, that today are the type specimens. So they are the two spear points that all of Clovis chipstone technology is defined from. And when you visit in the visitor center, you actually see uh, some examples of some of the faunal remains, some of the bones that have been found. Uh, this is a femur of a Columbian mammoth, so the leg bone of a mammoth, uh, which is about as tall as I am, so you can begin to picture how large these animals were. And this was found uh, back behind the visitor center here, so it is actually authentic, and it is from uh, Blackwater Draw. And when you come around the corner, we have remains on a, a, a shelf here, and I wanted to point out when I was talking about uh, the Ogallala deposits when we were in front of that big cliff face, and I mentioned the gompathir and the mandible, the lower jaw. This is the gompathir mandible that came out. Uh, it is the oldest fossil we, <coughs> pardon me, we have on display. It is five to seven million years old. So it's uh, very heavily mineralized, uh, whereas a lot of the more recent remains, even though they're still 13,000 years old, they're very similar to modern bone today. And one of the unique bones is this one. This is a small piece of a mammoth tusk, and the end of it, if you look closely, it's actually been carved off. It looks similar to what a beaver would do if a, a beaver is chewing on a log. But we think that this is actually evidence of humans over 13,000 years ago carving this tusk so they could snap the tip of it off. So we have direct evidence potentially uh, that we see on that particular element, uh, which is really cool. It's one of the most unique artifacts here at Blackwater Draw. And if we come around the corner, I'll squeeze by here. We have a small display of a few of the bison that have been found. Uh, I mentioned earlier that bison were hunted uh, throughout the entirety of the history that we see of humans here at Blackwater Draw. We have a Clovis Age bison kill, but we see it more commonly 
later in time, like we saw in the interpretive center, the two uh, stacked bison kills. But this gives you an idea of how big these animals were. So 25 to 30 percent larger than modern bison. Keep in mind, on the horn core, you would actually have a sheath, which would extend the length of these bison horns out to where you're looking at two and a half, three feet or more across. So much larger than any modern bison uh, species that's around today. When you come around into this room, you'll see remains on the table. Uh, these are all mammoth remains, primarily found in the 1960s. And unfortunately at that time, much of the material is just thrown onto a flatbed truck and is hauled into Portales and it was basically stored in the basement of a, a drugstore or a grocery store. So a lot of it's not preserved very well, but we can still uh, tell what was here. We have the mandible as well as the maxilla. So you can actually see, this is the, the lower tooth out of the jaw, and then coming down out of the, the top of the skull, we have another tooth. And mammoth teeth are designed like a washboard. They're designed to grind back and forth. And that's to process grasses, mostly, and flowering plants, which is what they primarily ate. We have a series of vertebrae here with the, the dorsal spines. So the spines create the hump on the back of the mammoth that you guys have probably seen in pictures. Another mandible with a, a tooth still in place, and you can see kind of the, the washboard pattern on the top of that. A rib, and this is actually a small one. Uh, it's not uncommon to see ribs that are about the length of this table. And then another section of a tusk tip. And along the walls, it's the history in photographs of this discovery. Uh, it was a commercial gravel mine at a time when there was actually more water at this site. And this photograph is really fun for me because some of the gravel mining was actually conducted from a barge out on the water using a dredge line. So in the pit that we walked through on the way down to the interpretive center and on the way to the north bank where we did the at a level demonstration, much of this area was actually underwater, uh, as recently as the 60s and 70s. Uh, today, that water table's dropped uh, pretty dramatically, and it's a very dry area, unfortunately. So we encourage you to come visit uh, once we're able to reopen again. And this is also a great opportunity for students to enroll in the Anthropology and Applied Archaeology program at Eastern New Mexico University. You can actually come out firsthand and have the opportunity to excavate at one of the most significant archaeological sites in all of North America. And you can also work as a student intern and work here at the site in the gift shop or actually work uh, at the museum on campus at Eastern New Mexico University.